Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And before we begin, Ed, a little bit of business. Yeah. I have a Kickstarter up live right now for Octobriana 1976. If you're watching this, please check that out. There's a link below the video to it. Printed with fluorescent ink, black light sensitive ink. The world's first black light comic book, I like to say. <laughs> I'm serializing my outlaw comic, Red Room, on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. But today, man, we got to talk about art out of time. Unknown Comics Visionaries, 1900 to 1969, uh, curated by Dan Nadell. Dude, I had a I had a ball going through this man. I, I spent I spent a lot of time with it this week leading up uh, to talking about the thing, and I imagine that this book is going to be referred to um, in future videos that we do together because it hits on something that's very important that we should never forget about. Man, we'll get into it in a minute. The whole conceit of the book, though, is. Yeah, so the conceit of the book, this came out, I think, in 2006, somewhere around there. Uh, at the time, Dan Nadell was publisher of Picture Box, much more connected to, say, the fine arts world than the typical people in comics. And I think it gives him a unique perspective. And so the conceit of this book is basically finding cartoonists throughout history who may be overlooked a little bit, but had a their own style. You know, they, they, were, they were cartoonists that were working atypically at the time in that they had a vision that wasn't like anything else. And sometimes that made them successful and sometimes it made them sort of more often <laughs> than not history. More often than not, uh, they did not, you know, the, 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 the ending of their personal story is not what you would want in or envision for your own life. Uh, when you grow up wanting to be a cartoonist, man, the contents are pretty interesting the way they're organized by, Exercises and exploration. So these are pe people that maybe are a little more formally innovative. Uh, slapstick, obviously comedy, but comedy often expressed in the drawing itself. Um, acts of drawing speaks for itself. Words and pictures and form and style. I kind of love this arrangement. There's a there's a lot that this book does right. And if, yes. you, if you just flip the page, the timeline is crucial to me. First off, it's called Art Out of Time, man. So give me some context. What, what are you talking about, man? And it'll illustrate, like, in the sidebar, uh, you know, on the next pages, it would be, like, Action Comics 1. And then uh, the stuff that is not in bold, I believe, or is the stuff that is in bold is the stuff we're talking about. Yeah, the bold is in this book. Okay. The other things are noteworthy comics history pieces. So things like Crazy Cat or Roy, Roy Crane doing wash tubs. Right. Things that are important to understand context for the, the comics that are in this book. Exactly. And that, and that's that's a great set of tools to have yes. and to know like as you go through and you look at uh, at these individual strips, man. Like you could you could make educated guesses if, if your comic book vocabulary is uh, strong enough, uh, but to have this sort of set things in stone is is so important. Um, the other text for me, it's highfalutin artsy fartsy talk, and I could I could summarize it all in like a sentence. And the sentence is, um, even when comics was it at its most like sort of culturally devoid, product oriented, you know whatever you want to call it, uh, there was still iconoclasm. Yeah, and one piece to pull out is how he found this stuff. So things like old fanzines, encyclopedias, interviews, it's the stuff that we tend to search for, right? It's the stuff that we highlight a lot on this channel. And it makes me think of, we looked at Glenn Bray's collection. Uh, it's a similar thing, you know? It's, it's finding the stuff of value, especially historically, whenever it's not always that easy. So this is dated October 2005, interesting time in comics whenever we're starting to see reprints of some of this stuff. So some of the artists that we get into here, as you said, Ed, we'll probably look at again uh, because they have gotten more attention um, since 2005. Yeah, and I think I think he is the reason. There's definitely some artists I love that I know I found in this, in this collection, you know, the first time I would have uh, seen them. Some of the comic strips, uh, this is Harry Grant Dart, is the artist here, Explorigator. And each of these has like some, I think it's in the back. Yeah. It has a uh, context and biography for each of the creators. And some of them are almost empty because it's just nothing's known about the creators, but others, you know, they, they may have been pretty successful in their time and then just fell out of favor for, you know, 
they just weren't recognized over time. And so there is information about them and, and he provides that. Uh, more than once uh, in this book, I'm pretty sure, he gives you the entire sh- strip. Like every, every strip of the Explorigator that exists is here. You know what I mean? It lasted four weeks or yeah. you know, 10 weeks or, or, or whatever. Clearly uh, inspired by like, you know, Windsor McKay was big at the time. And this is when the syndicates and the papers had just had some real, some real energy, you know, like King Features wanted to outdo, you know, Universal or press. So it's like everybody, if, if you do the popular thing, well, I got to have my version of that. And this is probably a rival papers, Windsor McKay wannabe. Beautiful art. It Man, is. Man, the coloring and stuff. We're going to end up looking, I think, at some comic strip stuff in the near future. And it's such a different world. Like, this was stuff that I never was exposed to either until a book like this comes out. Because there weren't good reprints of this in when I was reading in the 90s, you know. Pretty remarkable. Um, Howard Nostrand. This is from Witch's Tale. June 1954. Beautiful. Probably artistically one of my favorite uh, strips in, in this book. And clearly an Eisner guy. Maybe, maybe, like you get the impression, and I didn't read his biography, but uh, could he have been at the Eisner Iger studio or something? Man, he's definitely pulling from Will in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's... that's uh, a lot of double lighting. Apparent. Great coloring, though. All this red coloring. So interesting story here is that this is... This is based on uh, like an infection or a virus inside of a body. And, uh, you know, it's not clear as you're following the narrative until until the end. Uh, but he's being wiped out by medication, he, I guess. He's, he's a germ. Now, you know, this is one of those, like, well, what do we, what's the date? Can we see it easy? No, I guess not. Um, this was EC's competition. You know what, man? You say that, and all I see here are like the Jack Davis muddy boots from the war comics. Yeah, yeah, such a good touch. But story-wise... This is a piece of shit. And, and, and the, uh, frankly, like a lot of these comics, it's the, it's the art that drives it. And it, it does make me think like wrestling shit. Like whenever you get those LJN toys and you get like a special delivery Jones figure, and he's your favorite. <laughs> but then you see him wrestle in real life and you're like, that guy sucks. Uh, the reading experience of this is not the most enjoyable for almost all of these. Man, it's great drawing though. Like even that angle... These panels are so strong. Yeah, yeah, no, it's like, can't touch it. Uh, another example of comic strip. This is 1910, and it is The Wiggle Much, Herbert Crowley. If you if you flip the page, like, you'll get an example uh, of what the strip yes. really looks like. Because that's that's the one deficiency of, of, of the book, is they take those big, giant broadsheets that were printed in 1900 that are the size of this table... And reduce it down to eleven by you know eight and a half by eleven. It just doesn't. It loses all gravitas. This is one of the probably weirder strips in this whole book. And I think I think uh, Nadell talks about that. You know, like in the biography of this guy, this may be one that's not well known. Um, the the person behind it, but just strange in terms of the visual symbols. Like, what are these characters even representative of? Yeah. Uh, even the mark making. You know, it's just very unusual there are abstract elements and again what it's referencing in terms of being representational you tell me this is from 1910 and uh these guys who are playing around with this medium they were all iconoclasts you know they they had to invent this shit and this is in ink probably interpreting things that he's seen in like etchings and junk like that and there would be like weird representative filigree on covers and shit when I look at it now, it almost reminds me of something like a Cartoon Network, something that's pushing characters mm-hmm. beyond like, oh, that's a dog or that's a person. I just want to see if there's more of his stuff. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, I could draw a line to Tom Gold uh, looking at this because of that fixed mid-level camera that's view and, and the iconography of the drawings. Like, obviously, he's he's drawing weird weirdo shit here. <laughs> but if you replace it with, you know, humanoid figures or robots, you got a Tom Gold kind of it's storytelling so sensibility. And you mentioned the etchings and you can see it really in like these backgrounds. It's beautiful. It's beautiful line work, but very strange. Oh, here we go. Talking about strange. Yeah. So this is Ogden Whitney from 1964. This is from Herbie. Um, Herbie was published by ACG, uh, kind of a forgotten publisher in a lot of ways. You know, when all these publishers existed in the uh, in the 60s, whenever like Marvel sprung up. This is still around. And Herbie is a superhero, I guess you would say. <laughs> the Fat Fury. Um, 
Magic Lollipops, man. Yes. Deus Ex Lollipops, kind of like at the beginning of that Batman 1969 movie with the bat shark repellent. Lollipop for every occasion. Perfect. That is such a perfect description for this. The strip is surreal. It has Herbie going and encountering all kinds of weird adventures. There you see the lollipop belt. Uh, I think this is his grandfather who also partakes in the lollipops. <laughs> and they're just... They're both fat, just sitting there enjoying themselves. I think Herbie's dad's always giving him a hard time about being useless and fat. <laughs> and he and he's the one interesting-looking character because, like, everybody else is like clip art Bob Dobb Church of the Subgenius people. That's Ogden Whitney. You yeah. know, like Ogden Whitney has done other comics. Like, look at this, man. It's Winston Churchill. It's it's such an interesting art style because of the dullness, because of that clip art static, like everybody's frozen in place. It's a peculiar style. I fell in love with it whenever I encountered it. Look at the monster too, like on the screen they're watching. <laughs> it's it's just bizarre, but very clear, easy to read almost to a fault, the clarity, but also that's what makes the style. Yeah, I love these comics, and uh, Ogden Whitney's done a fair amount of work, has a very sad ending. He drew, I always get uh, Sky... Just put that on the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> he did uh, Skyman in the Golden Age, so right. like, you know, he has a 30-year career or something, and he did Skyman whenever superheroes were big and kind of hung on and continued on and then pretty much fell into alcoholism towards the end of his life and, you know, deteriorated. When, when he's tasked with doing something out of pure imagination, his aliens are as good as like the Neil Adams aliens and, in, in, uh, Muhammad Ali meets Superman. It's really bad. <laughs> Look at these panels though, of him being punched like into, into squiggles and then like springing back out interesting cartoonist and if you just saw that panel you'd have no idea that this panel would exist by the same guy in the same story so odd let alone this like like it's ma amazing like he's being knighted like it's <laughs> being knighted by something that looks like a collage paste up two pages after her kicking it with winston churchill <laughs> <laughs> those are really fun and we'll probably look at more ogden whitney at some point because i have a bunch of those herbie comics and love them uh raymond crawford Ewer, and this is Slim Jim, another early comic strip, 1911. And this is where uh, it would benefit to have a Warren Bernard here to talk comic strip history, to fill in some of these gaps, because I am so underread, especially in these early 20th century strips, because they just weren't available. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we could speak for for our own men, and uh, the this era of humor is the era of, like, Slowly I turned. And those jokes that ain't fucking funny, and I don't think it's been <laughs> funny for about 70 to 80 years. Uh, so don't don't expect uh, to fall down laughing or anything. But and, beautiful stuff. Yeah, and some of these are really obscure. This one I, is not it, but one of the strips in here appeared, I believe, in only one newspaper. Wow. So, you know, it wasn't even syndicated. It was like a staff artist that was drawing, you know, for however long that paper allowed him to do so but you know like talk about obscurity but look at these guys making up the rules you don't need just square panels you know like you could you could bounce around you could do different things man they're they're, they're figuring all this stuff out like before before our very eyes and i wonder like this extra stuff if this is to accommodate different sizes papers and by the way i don't know how well this shows up this could be a chris ware comic in character well we'll be getting into some chris ware influences uh later in this book for sure he was definitely, like, his dad was, I mean, his grandfather was juiced in with the newspapers, almost got a Pulitzer himself or something. Uh, Another note on this book. Notice stuff like this where he's pulling out an image to make, like, your your new story start, your page breaks, your chapter breaks and things. Very Chip Kid-esque, who was around at this time and was also doing this. But this kind of, like, really zooming in on a page, hugely important to me. You know, like, it changed how I looked at comics, especially because I had a scanner and I start start doing this myself and really looking at this stuff closely. Uh, this is Colorama by Bob Powell. Bob Powell did a little bit of Marvel, but, you know, more of a Golden Age guy. Really good draftsman. Man, all these guys have horrible... Like, they're, they, most of them seem like questionable people to be kind. Uh, I guess it was a different era. But Bob Powell could draw like nobody's business. And so you can find some of his stuff... In like Mr. Monster reprints some of his science fiction sci uh, flying saucer stories that are absolutely gorgeous, like just amazing pen and ink. What's the what's the bad part of, about him though? 
Like you don't, you don't remember? I, I don't remember the details. I, I don't know. You know, like like some of these guys, they just have such sordid histories. You know, I mean, some of them have they're they're criminals. You know, yeah. so it's probably in the bio. There um, there are these like, and I think he fits into this group of guys that I've. I have questions about the history of comics that, that I've never seen addressed, answered. And when I ask the people who I think would um, be the ones to answer, it inspires them to ask the question too. They like, no, we don't know the answer, man. But basically my thing is a lot of guys went to war in during world war two comics were still being made. And who were these fuckers that were making them? And I think that uh, Powell, if I'm, if I remember correctly, like he has like a club foot or like, some kind of thing that keeps you out of uh, World War II. So he's he was like one of the guys that got to like hang back. But when I ask people, I think I might have even asked Nadell once at a SPX or something. But I asked Warren, and it's like we can't. We that's like a lost, you know, like yeah. like the guys who were doing comics in like you know forty one, forty two. Like it's just who are who are these people? I think Bob Powell was one of them. Could be. Um, this is kind of a fun story because it has to do with this guy's sight. So you get to see some of these like subjective things of him experiencing loss of sight and losing specific color spectrum details. So a little bit formally interesting, but guy could draw. And like that's one of those examples, you know, I would have seen it with Frank Miller where there's no outline. It's just shadows are the only ink. And you can see it in there. Like this really caught my attention for a long time as a kid. So it always me stands too. out to me whenever the, someone does it. The John Byrne Fantastic Four covers, one Perfect. or two of those. Walter Corman, 1938. So again, Sunday strips in this case. Uh, very well drawn animal comics and kind of peculiar. You, you see, like they're so human, like in terms of body language too. You know, not just putting a, a raccoon eyes on a human figure, but actual body language and cartoon figures. Yeah, you you look at these things and man, it's like I I would love to check them out at a broadsheet size uh you could see man these guys are giving you your week's worth you know you read one and you and you're you're good till next sunday it's stunning from an illustration standpoint and this is the late 30s so you know time of the adventure strip would have been what we what a lot of the stuff that we would see reprinted from late 30s would have been the dick tracy's and and orphan annies and stuff all right so getting into slapstick um again a little summary of who these artists are what he means by slapstick and comics. Uh, Eric Larson still calls them funny books. You know, like this was what comics were known for, for a while. And these are some of the best probably in the history of American comics when it comes to funny drawings. So this is Milt Gross. Milt Gross has done a lot of comics work. Yeah. Like he, he's a sore thumb to me, uh, to, to be in here in, in, because he, he's a very popular and well-respected cartoonist. I guess maybe this era of his work, isn't known about very well that could be and i think that he went outside of what we think of of comics uh you know to, to become well known mm -hmm. um because he did stuff in hollywood right like i think so yeah like we certainly don't know pete we, and the pooch right and and we've looked at like um his paperback books you know where he would do like basically graphic novels so i think he was probably more well known from that maybe than this and also, this was just a dearth of reprints, especially of this sort. Like, look at this. What year is this? This is Milk Gross Funnies from 1947. So comic book reprints here. I love his drawings. This was a big eye-opener for me because I didn't see anybody that was drawing like this. You know, like really yeah. cartoony, really exaggerated, funny lines, you know, movement. It was just very animated. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a that's the perfect way to put it. And I've I've been watching. Uh, I I grabbed a bunch of like you know season one Looney Tunes, and the animation in that is stellar. Like it's unbelievable the amount of range and movement and and form that they get in in those in those I've simple gone shapes. A couple phases with those too. Like when I first re encountered those as an adult, it was like eye opening. Yeah, magical. Uh, notice like the panel layouts and stuff like he's just every every piece of that page every mark he's making is something that he can play with and employ to this end you know to the entertainment idea and it is it is like physical comedy in this case it really is like literal slapstick Man, talk about like a Looney Tune comparison. How much this dog is never in the same pose twice. It's constantly moving. Everybody is, you know. Pretty uh, 
interesting, innovative layouts too. I think you called out a, uh, a newspaper cartoonist for that, but I feel like you see it in a lot of these guys. They're and just I, constantly, it's like they're, uh, they have that energy. So this is next artist, Stan McGovern, uh, 1944. These are daily strips. And look, man, you don't have to just use four squares. I also love all the lettering and stuff. You get to see such a variety of just mark making and looks and I don't know if it is uh, time-based, you know. I think it's just these guys all had different styles. I mean, at this point in the 40s, it was it was somewhat codified. That's a great one. The negative space of, like, she's peering into the, the jaws of this this creature thing. I like the competition aspect of uh, the, the daily comic strip of, like, you're going to be on a page with, like, 30 other guys... Let's try to let's try to stand out, man. Let's 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 battle a little bit. Here's a piece I never hardly see. He's taking his daily comic strip that's you know usually one panel next to each other, splitting it into two rows. Does it a couple times. Man, that's really going for it. That's in, making some extra work for put, yourself right there. Putting in his day's work, man, for sure. This is Dick Briefer. Uh, I know him for drawing Frankenstein, and I probably learned about him from this. And he's one of those artists who would draw straight to ink. That's that's what I hear. And and I uh, I discovered him from here absolutely, and I was I was thrilled that I did, man. This character design looks like something I would see in a book of how to draw caricatures or something. Yeah, like when it's such shits. a cartoon. It's such a cartoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look, it's on the same page with this guy who has like the two two upsized vertical head. And then, I mean, just look at Frankenstein himself. Like, that that's an amazing design. It's unfor its an unforgettable design. The the color steps are real interesting. You know, they're, they're cutting up, they're, they're using weird, like, the, the cyan plate is some weird gnarly shit, because you could see it here, too. It's like they ran out of dots that day or something. Yeah, I can't, I don't even know exactly how those films are created or what they were working with, but yeah, you can see that. I was thinking that this was a little bit later because it reminds me of some of the animation, like that mid-century modern type animation, the more minimal kind of stuff. Yeah, where the tree and, is. And some just of these really feel whatever. like it. But uh, it's 1946 is the date on this, so he'd be in the front end of that, I think. But again, this character design, ridiculous. There's a Cold War piece to that. It's a little Stalin-ish. And uh, the Frankenstein stuff has, is one of those books that has been reprinted. I don't know about it in its entirety. I don't know how long he did this strip. And I don't know that he did the straight to ink or the comedy the whole time. I think in the beginning it was more of a Frankenstein book. And at some point it made a turn into this direction of just more, you know, more comedic tongue in cheek. You can, uh, there, there are, you know, iconic old photos of the, uh, the little kid at the newsstand with at the soda jerk fountain and like all that stuff and you like see the racks the frankenstein comics stand out like they will catch your eye more than almost anything man like there's like three or four of those iconic shots and uh it's the frankenstein comics that always pop out to me first that's interesting i have to keep an eye out on those pictures now when i go back into it i'm just admiring this hand as we're as we're looking here it's a it's a fun drawing style um Jack's Diary. So this is Jack Mendelssohn. I believe he had a strip, like a comic strip, and then parlayed that, or maybe got demoted, I don't know that it was a step up, right. into a comic book. And so this is the comic book. This was one of the most influential pieces I took out of this book whenever I got hold of it, because he's drawing it as if it were a kid drawing the comic. Obviously, he's an adult and can draw, like he's a professional cartoonist. I don't know that. Like I, I, feel I like think this, he's done some other wrong. stuff. Okay. This is very intentional, this idea of, like, how do kids draw? And, I mean, it's better than a kid would do. You know, mm -hmm. it's much more focused and coherent. But clearly, it is playing to that style yeah. of, of simple shapes and the way, like, the legs and arms connect and everything. The side profiles, you get to see one eye fits the side. Um, and the lettering, you know, like, this kind of, like, crude, broken lettering style. I love this. This, to me, was, like, almost like uh, when you see Bill Sienkiewicz do an Electra Assassin, Number one, that probably would have been where I saw something like that first of someone approximating a kid's art style. But this ran, I think, a couple of issues. And like I said, I believe it was a comic strip for a while as well. But certainly uh, pushed the boundaries in one direction as to what you could do stylistically. You know, I tend to jump around with styles and it's because I would see stuff like this and be like, oh, you could consciously apply a style for a specific effect. All right, acts of drawing, and uh, we're, we're going to get into some big ones in here. 
This is Charles Payne. I am not very familiar with him. 1918, another uh, Sunday newspaper collections. Note about the reproduction. This was something that everybody wrestled with for a long time as to how to reproduce these old comics. I feel like this is a really satisfying way to do it. Uh, whenever they're super cleaned up, I think you lose something. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously black and white's terrible for something in color like this. You lose something. But I thought this was a pretty good way to do it. And it was one of the early books that, that had this kind of attention. Like, scan the document and kind of keep it the way it looks right. with that age on it. Here we go. Fletcher Hanks. Uh, this is Stardust from 1940. So Fletcher Hanks' probably first appearance for a lot of us is in Raw. Uh, Raw magazine. Art Spiegelman reprinted some of his work. Fletcher Hanks has been collected since the publication of this book in a couple of volumes by Fanographics. He's a standout. He epitomizes what this collection is, that idea of these artists who had this distinct, unique style and voice, uh, good or bad, you know, sprinkled throughout the history of comics. Fletcher Hanks is one of those guys. Stardust is like nightmare superhero fuel. Twisted. <laughs> the, uh, the reaction that Fletcher Hanks gets like he's never had a issue of his own you know what I'm saying like where he did everything it's always anthologies that was that was the the modus operandi of comic book making in in the 30s uh so he's always bunched up with others and in this book he's bunched up with others and I think you have the same reaction every time for the past hundred years like it's arresting imagery like you stop in your tracks and you're like what the fuck is this man a mental patient draw this? Like, where did this come from? That's a good summary. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's been a little bit more information. He's a guy that his fate is not well known, but in the collections Fanographics put out, Paul Karasik edited them and did try to track down as much info as he could. And it's it's a it's a bad ending like you would expect. He, he's, you know, abusive and alcoholic and I think dies penniless and alone on a park bench somewhere. That's so the story. Petrified and frozen. I got to read a couple of these, though, to kind of show the demented voice here. So he's grabbing this alien who had done something evil, and the alien says, where are you taking me? And Stardust says, I'll show you the charred bodies of the millions of people you have killed. <laughs> it's, it's always just some horrendous crime followed by some equally horrendous punishment dished out by Stardust. Very Old Testament kind of guy, that Fletcher Hanks. Completely. And, you know, you can see those charred remains as they're, like, flying over this burnt-out world. I like I like the, the spare line work because it's in these old comics. It's, like, the one of the few times where you see these, like, giant fields of color. And, like, the giant fields of color and is a trope of Fletcher Hanks to me. It's, like, it's part of the style, you know, to get, like, these big blocks of blue and green and orange. And also to have all the colors, like... Every color of the basic Crayola crayon box on one page, that's another piece. Yeah, this is the stereotype of like superhero comics and comics being like the primary colors. This is your poster child. Garrett Price, White Boy. This was a newspaper strip. Um, I believe it's about a white kid who ends up in Native... Am maybe being raised by Native Americans. And so White Boy would be his nickname. You know how... how in, in pop culture, Native Americans have these names. So I think that's why he is white boy and how he relates in this frontier world. And for a long time, this was a comic that I would hear about. It's like, what's the great comic that hasn't been collected? And it would always be white boy. And since then, I think Sunday Press has put out a collection, like a big full-size collection, I think. I think directly after this, in the, two, in the 2000s, uh, that's so good. Comics Journal would uh got into the game of reprinting a bunch of public domain stuff like in in in, in their issues and they did at least one big uh block of white boy but i i seem to remember seeing white boy in more than one uh issue so maybe they kept it going for a little little while but this is beautiful like the colors of you know the ravine that they're jumping over lifting a horse up with the rope and stuff it's really great and then your night scene that's all blue it's a very pretty strip yeah it's fascinating like like, uh, I look at this and I, I like it too, but, but it's, it's, you know, this is, we're a couple comic book guys. Like, I, I don't see this thing selling two cents, uh, to, to the, the wider world, you know? And those syndicates were out for blood. Like all they cared about was 
was making money, man. So surprising to that it even has you know twenty pages. That's a great title, like panel sequence of them going through, you know, looking through the woods as they're as they're canoeing down the stream. You even get a little bit of the reflection of the canoe in the stream. Damn, gotta draw buffalo and hippopotamus and shit. All of this stuff, like all these water scenes, and then at night, it's nice work. Yeah, all the animals. That's tough. That's a special band of cartoonists that has to draw all the animals. All right. A.E. Howard, Somebody's Stenog. This is 1920s, uh, this strip. Look at that, man. S. Clay Wilson was ghosting for him that week. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the variety between two pages. Yeah. A couple of years in between those pages, but still quite a variety in approach to layout. We're talking 1932 with this batch. And even here, big time variation in style. Jefferson Mackamer? Mackamer? I don't think I've seen more of this person's work. This is 1937. I wonder if this is the one that only appears in like one newspaper. And then the reason that this series runs to 1969, because I think almost everything in here is pre-1960, with one exception, and that's Rory Hayes. Rory Hayes was um, the underground of the underground cartoonists. He also has had a couple of collections since this book was published. Um, he was a very young underground cartoonist that, that kind of gravitated toward the underground comics, made underground comics with those guys, and died very young. And I think if you look at his comics, stare at that page for a minute, you can tell he he had he was a troubled guy. These are outlaw comics, man. They are outlaw These comics. These are outlaw comics in the days of the underground comics. And that underground term was not a sales mechanism. The comics were underground. You had to get them at the same places where you could get shit to smoke weed with. Yeah. And even the underground guys, because they write about, you know, they talk about him in like intros and stuff in some of the collections, even they recognize this stuff was of a different, it was, it was a different type of cartoonist that was making this work. He saw the world differently than, than most of us. Uh, this is from Boogeyman Comics number two. I think there were two or three issues of Boogeyman Comics published, which was his main title. Uh, a lot of the undergrounds were anthologies and cartoonists would contribute to a variety of them. Uh, Boogeyman was like his title, his main, his main comic. I dig his stuff. We'll probably look at him again at some point. But, you know, speaking of drawing, you can see, like, all the techniques that he's doing. Like, pointillism is applied here, but then it's right next to a bunch of parallel lines. Um, just in inventive. Like, it's just stuff that no other comic looks like Rory Hayes. For the dudes around our age and younger, um, the way that you discover Rory Hayes is from Understanding Comics uh, by Scott McCloud. There's a panel or two where he's talking about Rory Hayes, and he shows off that little fucked up teddy bear, and uh, you'll never forget it once you see it, man. Yeah, and, and we saw uh, Glenn Bray has quite a quite a bit of Rory Hayes in his collection, so we'll look at more Rory Hayes in the future, because I, I find him to be a real compelling cartoonist. All right, words and pictures. So possibly a little more focus here on story and, uh, and the writers behind some of this stuff, and start with Harry Hirschfeld. And this is 1913 Daily Strips. And already we find another guy who's splitting the, uh, the, the, the row into two rows. And drawing a bunch of animals too, man. Yes. See, those guys, like, they, uh, what, what's, the, what's the date on these? 1913. Okay. But look at this, like bringing in a photo, like an aqua tint or something. I don't even know what the technique would be I, uh, to bring that in. A Degora type? S something. <laughs> <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Unbelievable, man. And and I, I like that they did not... All these vertical, skinny, vertical panels. I, I like that they didn't solidify the four square beat at this point. They're, they're playing around with all sorts of choices. You can see here he's missing the T here in afternoon. So, you know, wordplay involved, not just the uh, not just the graphic stuff. Man, the guy's drawing all kinds of things, though, from people swimming and these weird page layouts to, like, some kind of car bike racing series. If these are sequential every fucking day, this that you're doing this, man. That is rigorous day? drawing. That's crazy. The wind gusting the leaves around. Ooh, some typography, man. I was just gonna point that out. Yeah, this is a an incredible looking strip. Dauntless Durham of the USA. 
I don't know of any collections of this. Um, no. This could be one of those, Ed, you mentioned, like, some of these are, like, the complete run. It's possible this is the complete run of this strip, too. Cecil Jensen, this is Elmo number one. I really like the, the 12 square per page format. There's a lot of, uh, where, where would I have, oh, you know who does it great, man? Probably my favorite uh, Robert Crumb story mm. is is that, man, called That's Life, where it's the, it's like a southern, like, blues guy, like, leaving home, makes a record, dies in obscurity, record gets found by, you know, Terry Zwagoff <laughs> type in the 70s. But it's, it's, it's that format. This reminds me a little bit of Cowboy Hank. It reminds me a lot of different European comics that have this kind of tighter grid. Yeah, this is, this is, like an example of the people drawing for comic books who probably wanted to have a daily strip. So they're st like staying in that rigid format. And maybe these are reconstituted daily strips that have been put in, into, you know, the, these arrangements or whatever, man. But you, you'll see a lot of this stuff. I mean, just the, the, the iconography of the drawing looks like this guy's trying yeah. to shoot a shot for the newspapers and coming up short how dense is this it feels like a graphic novel that you're reading here on one page those those crumb uh like he would do these strips in, in weirdo that would be the 12 panel grid as well and it would be an eight uh it would be an eight page story that takes would take you as long to read as a 22 page fucking chris claremont x-men comic that's really saying something yeah <laughs> uh, booty rogers sparky watts this is 1948, and Booty Rogers, another cartoonist that I would have learned about in Raw magazine. Absolutely, man. Raw, uh, volume two, number two, man. Never forget it. Yeah, and Booty Rogers' stuff has been reprinted since then, and I believe his story is that he did a couple of these comics, you know, for a couple years or whatever, and then left comics. You know, like he didn't find success at the time, and gotta gotta pay the bills. Yeah, I, I detect like uh, like Wolverton's pre grotesque kind of style is in here, like you know, chicken and egg. Who comes first? I don't know. Yeah, I always thought of him as having like a certain um, rural Appalachian sensibility, and I don't know if I'm grafting some of that onto him or if I read something somewhere, but it does feel like a different voice than most of the comics that I think of. And now, you know, I think it's easier to have those different voices find an audience back then i'm not so sure <laughs> that's pretty weird i mean the story in in raw is that that old guy who has like a pegasus body or something <laughs> that's right <coughs> it's almost like he's trying it out with that alien sled see that that's like the wolverton <laughs> I mean, bits look at man that thing it's got a hand coming out of its head conducting music that is held up by a hand coming out of its butt it's a one-man band it is a one-man band. One-man orchestra. And look at this, man. I, like, I thought this was like behind the, like, that little x-ray machine, and that's like what's inside them. <laughs> oh, man. He must have had something of a thing for that, the, those bodies. Oh, uh, yeah, the bean effect, as uh, Robert Crumb calls it. I have a thing for those kind of bodies, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Van Damme comic book count the amount of times he does splits in blood sport i tell you man it's ridiculous it's like the director found out he could do that and it's like every two three minutes look at that man that's crazy this is uh harry j tuttle and that's january 1st 1933 so bringing in the new years with some uh bird hunting they would do that stuff like i bet those would be the sunday um sections to really seek out man like the like the turn of the new year stuff because windsor windsor mckay would always do something great I I love this. I think these figures are real fun, but it makes me think of Ivan Brunetti and Chris Ware and that idea of like repeating sized figures and creating more of animation. Right. And uh, this is the Bungle family, the strip that we're looking at. And this would be, you know, Frank King era, you know, probably one of the bigger names in comics at this time period. And I think you can see some. Her Harold Gray would use that kind of format as well. I also think... When you mentioned Chris Ware earlier, color palettes is something that I could see being pulled from this kind of time period. Watch when we come up to that one guy, man, where it's like Chris Ware. It, Chris Ware was the only guy that knew about this one dude for a time. I, I swear, man. Love this. I love whenever you do look at a series of any of these strip artists, especially noteworthy strip artists, you'll see them pulling variety and, and you know some experimentation and just really changing things up. All right, this is C.W. Calls, Kales, 
Hairbreath Harry, and 1924. I'm looking to see, like, I don't know if I'll recognize the, the strip that only ran in one newspaper, but... Yeah. I, I think I've heard of Hairbreath Harry, so I don't think this would be the one. I also sometimes think about this stuff in terms of period stories. Mm -hmm. And, like, what is the world like where this is sort of representative of the world? I hear you, man. <laughs> it's, it feels so different. Everybody's wearing suits. There's very few cars. It's just a different world. The vernacular's amazing, too. Now I'm looking at, like, this bottom piece, and I think it's the exact same in both of these. I wonder what the deal is there. That's strange. In a couple of years, they'll figure out, let's, uh, let's do strips down there, too. All right, form and style. And this is the guy. Charles Forbell. This is uh, 1913. This is the Chris Ware stuff, and and, the, and these ain't the pages necessarily. Naughty Pete. But, like, look, typography. Yeah. Thick borders. Color. Some of the palette. lettering here is very. Uh... And it just it's incessant. It keeps going. Like there's there will be more of that. Uh, but this is definitely something that Chris Ware was looking at, um, when he was doing like Quint. I mean, just whatever he does, really. But like this, come yeah. on now. You can imagine little Quimby the mouse man and, and that little Sparky the cat or whatever. These are very beautiful drawing-wise. Really interesting comics. You know, I mean, like, we've been looking, the last couple of strips were the 20s and then the 30s before that. This is the early teens. Yeah. Like, this is somebody really on top of their game and, and probably somebody that was influential and then, you know, slipped into the cracks of time uh, until until Nadell brings this book out. Because this this looks like it could be... Much more contemporary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could see Annie Koyama printing some cartoonists that looks like this, man. But you see different typography styles. Like, this is this is like Jimmy Corrigan era Chris Ware. You know, like... Yes. Yeah. Like, the first, like, the first, like, dozen pages. You know, Acme Novelty 1 era. And you see him experimenting page layouts. Like, that's pretty good. We haven't seen something like that. And we haven't seen this from the sample of pages that we've seen of Naughty Pete in here. Limited color palette. Like, that that's something that, um, when, when you have access to color, you want to use all the colors, man. T.E. Powers. This is 1911. So, pretty close to Naughty Pete. This is two years difference in, in these two pages. Joys and Glooms, I guess, is the name of this. See, and I bet that would be a funny title in 1910, when Nichols had bees when when Nichols had bees on them. Man, look at the hatching in that. Talk about a different era. Gustave Verbeek, 1904. So we're even going backwards. This is one of the probably most uh, strange comics that's reprinted here because if you look closely. You can flip this upside down and read it. <laughs> and, you know, there's text that runs upside down. So, like, it's a different strip, you know, if you're going in this direction. And actually, I believe you read one way and then flip it. So it's it's like a almost like a 12-panel gag. So weird. You know, and you'll see, like, this reminds me of those images where do you see the old woman in profile right. or the young lady? Because, you know, keep your eye on that. It's pretty easy to see a guy with a beard. Yeah, now you got to think about doing this every week. Yeah, I mean it's it's amazing that that face works both ways. That now it's this this just a kid like that's doing some magic. Yeah, and you know at the same time just drawing the shit out of this stuff. But the upside down, I don't know how you do that. Like don't don't you just drive yourself crazy with that concept? So of course uh, you can't do that forever. This is still uh, same artist, but. This is actually... Okay, so this is like a year later. The terrors of the tiny the tiny tabs. And it only reads in one direction. Yeah. But it does allow him to continue with the great artwork and concentrating probably on that. You can see the pen work on display in these. This would happen, like... I, I don't know if it was due to maybe the war or the um, Great Depression or, or something, man, but you would... There would be 
eras where like Windsor McKay is uh, Little Nemo is a one color hmm. strip. You know, just you know, one plate is used. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting because I could see it varying from like newspapers. You know, if there was some two color press or something. Because there was probably some like adjustment as stuff went more full color, right uh, across the country. I would assume there'd be some range. All right, man. So this is Gene Deitch. Rest in peace. Yes, and this is his strip, Terrible Thompson. I find his cartooning very attractive, and it's squarely in that. This is 1955. When I think of that like minimal modern animation style, this is what's in my head. Totally, like the Mr. Magoo era. Uh, certainly the stuff that, you know, John, John Christopher Lucy would jerk off to or whatever. It's Gene Deitch that is their porn. Yeah, and I love it. In black and white, you see, like, a bunch of interesting textures, scribbles, super heavy line next to a very thin line. But then also when he does color, it's equally great. He's an outstanding artist. Yeah. Yeah, this this work is, like, very, like, hip. Yeah. Or hep. Hep. <laughs> Copacetic. George Carlson, 1943, uh, Jingle Jangle Comics number two, so back to comic book artist. I uh, discovered Carlson's work in the Smithsonian book on comic books, not to be confused with the Smithsonian book on comic strips, and similar strips, like like playing around with page layout in weird ways, looking like, to, to me, at least the stuff in the Smithsonian book, um, it, it, like some version of uh like a dr seuss kind yeah. of energy that makes sense because dr seuss would have been fooling around with comics a little bit around this time yeah. so a strip called haji his aesthetic may be reflective of that wider you know what was going on kind of across the board norman e Jeanette, 1909 man those that first century the first decade of the 20th century it really is the wild, wild west on the Sunday pages. And also, dudes drawing their socks off, man. Like, the line work on this stuff, it's hard to even f follow them. Look at that character design. It's so bizarre. Yeah, all of this stuff. That's the other part. Is It all feels surrealistic and nightmarish, almost all of it. <laughs> right. Which, again, makes me wonder, like, what is going on in the world at that time? Yeah, a couple of world wars, economic collapse. This was your your uh, main narrative, visual narrative. You know, like there's no TV. If you're living anywhere except some big city, there's no state, you know, there's no theater or anything that you'd have access to. Obviously no movies. So it's like, this was everything. All right. So the back of the book here are the biographies. And this is one of the nicer features. Again, like whenever people started reprinting or, or bringing, excavating comics history, there's a wide range of quality in how that's handled. This is one of the standout books for all these reasons, from reproduction quality to having this kind of extra information to tell us about what we just saw, who did it, what else they did, um, you know, whatever bio information exists. It's so valuable. Like, this is the first time I saw or heard of most of these artists. So then to be able to find out more about the ones that spoke to me, um, just fantastic. Like, every archival book should should have this kind of info. Dan Nadell did his due diligence, man. Like, like very often, uh, there are these reprint kind of books, man, and I bristle at seeing, like, some dude's name on the fucking cover that, that never, you know, drew the any of the contents. But Nadell did a bunch of legwork. Uh, so much legwork, in fact, that I'm going to let him have his Pat Sajak Mannix <laughs> uh, portrait in the back there, man, to kind of top us off. Love the end pages, too. Like, there's one of your Frankenstein covers, Ed. Imagine that on one of those black and white newsprints and uh, Frankenstein and his gang having a good time. Sparky Watts. That's the Jack's Diary, the kids' comic. Yeah, it's amazing. That, uh, that stood out to me. So this was a great, great book, man. I picked this up whenever it came out, probably at Phantom of the Attic, and I have spent a lot of time with it. So many artists that I would go on to become fans of because of this book. I think this did... Uh good numbers and i think you could uh find it pretty easy on ebay and if not i don't think i've been to a library that doesn't have it for 20 years yeah that that was one of the things i was going to tell k fabers is check the library listings because you you can probably get a hold of a copy of this to read uh pretty easily jim when we have such a big meal like this it takes a while to digest man and i think we got to get out of here man but hit them with a little business before we do 
Remember, I am running my first Kickstarter for Octobriana 1976, the world's first Blacklight comic book. It's a fucking killer, too, man. I got a chance to read it. One of the benefits of uh, being in comics is you get those sneak peeks, <laughs> man. And I'm giving people sneak peeks of the comic I'm working on now. It's called Red Room. It's at patreon.com uh, slash edpiscor. And uh, you're going to be able to read the comic there before anybody else is going to, man. But also, like, uh, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when fresh videos are available. And we put out videos several times a week, man. You want to be an early adopter of those, too. Be one of the cool kids. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video to make sure you avoid missing any of the videos that we post. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video as well. I'm ready to call it quits, Jimmy, man. You good? I'm good, Ed. Give them the marching orders, dude. Read more comics.